So this is an old VCR recorder. It's actually a VCR DVD. Now, you can still find these things hiding in people's attics or occasionally getting thrown away. They're not as popular as they once were, obviously, but you find quite a lot of them just collecting dust somewhere. Now, if you take the top off, what you'll find inside, this one anyway, is the carriage return for the video cassette, and obviously the CD DVD drive are right here. Now, if we take out the carriage return, which is that section here, then it's only held on by three screws, there, there, and there. So you undo those screws, you take out the carriage return. What you'll find attached to the carriage return are two things, actually. Underneath, you'll find this. Looks a bit like a flywheel. And on top, you'll find this. Now, this is the tip head drum. To remove that, again, it's really simple. There are three screws underneath, and you remove the tip head drum. And the same thing with this. It'll have a rubber band around it on the central pulley, three screws holding it on, and you take that off. Now, this looks like a flywheel, but actually it isn't. It's actually a brushless motor, which is really, really cool because it's got this flat pancake profile. And the same is true of these things. These things have a brushless motor right there, driving these rather pretty aluminium heads. So we put that to one side. It's this pulley that we're going to use. Now, you'll see on the pulley there's a couple of screws holding the circuit board down. If you undo those two screws, you can actually separate the pulley out and you get two sections to the pulley. This section, which is the coil section, and then the outer case section, which is what I'm looking for, which is right here. So we have the outer bit that spins on there, and then this motor coil bit, which did attach to there. Now, we're going to make this into a generator and not a motor. And I've done a video on um, how to do that, but let me give you a close-up of this anyway. So here's a close-up of it. Now, if you want to know more about this, check out the uh, video I did called All About Brushless DC Motors when I go further into this. But basically what we need to do is identify where those three dots of solder are because they're the ends of the coils and we need to solder on a three-phase bridge rectifier, which is really easy and I'll show you that in a moment. But as I said, the full details on it are on that video. The other thing we need to do is remove all of these electronics, just leaving three wires soldered onto those dots there. Okay, so all I've done is remove the circuit board and solder a wire to each of the ends of the coils. That blob of solder is the common, so this is obviously a Y configuration. Like I said, if you want to know more about this, check out that uh, brushless DC motor video that I did. Then I've taken those three wires and I've put them in a three-phase bridge rectifier right there, which is six diodes. And I've taken off the DC outputs there. So clearly what I need to do now is mount that in some arrangement that will get that to spin. And obviously there's a whole load of things you could do with that. You could put a little um, Pelton wheel on it and spin it with water. We could put an, uh, some fan blades on it and get it to spin in the air. We could put a um, fan rotor on it and make a little VAWT. There's just a ton of things you could do because all you really need to do is to get that to spin. So let's mount up that up in something where we can get it to spin and output. Okay, so you can see all I've actually done with it is I've stuck this squirrel cage rotor on it. It's from a fan, actually. It's got a cone in the middle and it's a squirrel cage rotor. Stuck on the top and I've stuck a pipe on it so I can actually hold it. Now, this thing will take air from this direction but works better with the air from that direction. Don't get too tied up with what I've done on the generation side of things, incidentally. It's just to illustrate something, okay? It's not what I'm recommending as a particular thing because there's just so much you could do with such a thing. Like I say, a water wheel, uh, different, um, a normal propeller, a, a, a VAWT, just a whole host of things. And all I'm gonna do is put a, a hairdryer on this and spin it up a little bit. That's really all I'm gonna do. So I'll just check everything is connected. Yep, fantastic. And we'll put a hairdryer on and watch that spin and have a look at some faults being generated. Okay, so about 1.6 volts. <laughs> you might hear the music, actually. Um, so that's my new neighbours. They've just moved in there. They're actually uh, chefs, in fact. And what they're doing is this. Uh, it's Italian Zimbabwean fusion, apparently. 
Uh, I've tasted it actually because they come round every now and then with something. And it's just, it's delicious. It's really nice food. Really is my kind of food. I mean, th this isn't my kind of music, but the food they do is my kind of few food. You know, it's that kind of like spicy bit of heat. Really lovely stuff. Um, I believe actually they're on Instagram and Facebook. If anybody's in the Canterbury area and wants to look them up, I can certainly recommend them. But let's get back to this. So, I get told a lot of the times that reading voltage isn't telling you anything. And I think, well, actually that's kind of fair enough, actually. So what I've started doing is putting a capacitor across it and putting some charge in the capacitor. And people have been saying, well, some folks have been saying equally, that's an unfair test because it doesn't tell you what it's generating. And I suppose that's kind of fair too. It doesn't tell you what it's generating. But when you stop, it certainly tells you what you have generated because what you have generated is being stored in this capacitor. So if I start this capacitor off and give that a bit of time to actually charge a bit. And you can actually watch the voltage going up. Now in this case, of course, we're measuring the voltage across the capacitor, not the voltage of the output. When I turn that off, of course, the voltage stays stable because we're still measuring the voltage in the capacitor. Now, this one is a 500 farad 2.7 volt supercapacitor, but it's still a capacitor. And if I want to know if I've actually got something on there, that this is real and can do some work, well, let's put it on a motor and watch that motor spin. Ta-da! So, there is real energy on here. That energy has come from here, gone into here, and is driving this motor here. If we want to know how much energy we've got, dead simple. 500 farads for capacitor, whatever the voltage is read across that, you can calculate the joules, and that's what's come from here and gone into here, and is now doing real work across this motor. So I, I don't necessarily agree that just putting a capacitor across a generator doesn't give you information on what that generator is producing. I think it depends how you deal with it, actually. I don't think you necessarily need to put a resistor across. I mean, sure, putting a resistor across is a standard way of doing it, but I don't think you actually absolutely have to. I think there are other ways of doing things if you think around a little bit. And, and I find this, to me, far more satisfying because I want to know how much power I've got stored away so that I can do something with it later. If you don't like power, then how much energy I've got. Now, like I said, don't get tied up with this particular arrangement. It's just for me to test those ideas out. But the illustration here really is, it's dead simple to do something on your tabletop. You can actually make yourself a usable generator, creating usable energy to do some work with a few basic tools and a few bits and pieces. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video and thank you very much for watching.